Thank you. Follow up, Mr. President. Amid talks of arming teachers and mental health, what specific commitments to American students can you make that these policies will make them safer? Well, I think it's going to make it safer. And, you know, the problem that's been happening over the last 20 years is people have talked. You said it. It's all talk. It's no action. And we're going to take action. I think it's going to make it safer. I think the fact that you have some capability within a school, they're not going to go into that school. They're not going to do it. You can look at what's happened with airplanes, where we put marshals on planes with guns, where pilots in many cases have guns. Nothing's happened for a long period of time. When it used to almost, it was getting to a point of being routine. When you have somebody with a gun staring you down, it's going to be a lot different for them to walk into those schools. Right now, they look at the sign outside. This is a gun-free environment. That means they're the only one with a gun. And the damage this lunatic did in that school for such a long period of time. And frankly, you had a gun, and he was outside as a guard, and he decided not to go in. That was not his finest moment, that I can tell you. He waited, and he didn't want to go into the school. I just heard this, and it's a terrible situation. But we need people that can take care of our children. We're not going to let this happen again. And the way it's not going to happen again, because they're basically cowards. Innately, they're cowards. And if they know bad things happen to them once they get into that school, by people that love the children. See, a security guard doesn't know the children, doesn't love the children. This man standing outside of the school the other day doesn't love the children, probably doesn't know the children. The teachers love their children. They love their pupils. They love their students. They're doing it also from love. Now, they have to be very adept. I'm not talking about every teacher. I'm talking about a small percentage. But people that have great ability with weaponry, with guns, those are the only people I'm talking about. But they'll protect the student. Uh, for the Prime Minister? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, for joining us today here in Washington. Australia is known for helping the Syrian people and Syrian refugees. So I ask you today, as the world watches, what steps can Australia take with the help of President Trump and the United States to ensure that civilians are protected in eastern Ghouta? Well, the, the Australian, uh, force, Australian armed forces have been working as part of the coalition to defeat Daesh in Iraq and Syria for some time now. Uh, it's uh, been, we are, our, our principal concentration or focus of our efforts now is in Iraq uh, as opposed to Syria. Uh, where we are training uh, both their elite special forces unit, their counterterrorism service, and their uh, regular army and uh, armed police. We have a very trained over 30,000 personnel uh, at our, um, at our uh, task force Taji, which is based at the Taji airfield uh, near Baghdad. Uh, the, in terms of refugees, Australia uh, has a very substantial humanitarian program. We are currently taking about 18,000 refugees a year. Uh, we've taken, uh, we've taken 12,000 from the, in addition to that, from the Syrian conflict zone. But uh, we, we determine which, we are very careful about uh, security, of course, in terms of uh, our humanitarian program. But I think it would be fair to say that the, the President uh, uh, has, of course, uh, the most insight into this area here, but it would be fair to say that ultimately the resolution in Syria has to be a political settlement, and that, I'm sure, is what uh, Secretary Tillerson is, uh, is working towards. And if I could briefly follow up, specifically, though, in Syria, as two of the most powerful men in the entire world, is there anything <laughs> that you can do to stop the bloodshed? Well, the, ultimately, there has to be a political settlement. It is a, you, you know, the, the campaign to destroy Daesh or ISIL uh, has been largely completed. Their terror, you know, the so-called caliphate has been reduced down to, you know, a, a few pockets. Uh, it's been, it has been smashed. And that has been, and Americans and Australians have worked uh, bravely, uh, effectively, uh, with our allies and partners in the region to do that. And that's very important, by the way, to keep Australians and Americans safe at home, because the, the image of ISIL's invincible caliphate 
you know, sweeping across Syria and Iraq, and they said they were going to sweep across Europe. All of that was a big recruiting tool. So this was a very important part of our global effort. But ultimately, uh, the settlement in, those, in that region has to come from a political settlement among the people who live there. I will say what Russia and what Iran and what Syria have done recently is a humanitarian disgrace. I will tell you that. We're there for one reason. We're there to get ISIS and get rid of ISIS and go home. We're not there for any other reason. And we've largely accomplished our goal. But what those three countries have done to people over the last short period of time is a disgrace. Okay, would you like to ask a question, Mr. Prime Minister? Yes, uh, I think, uh, yes, we Phil Curry from the Australian Financial Review. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, Mr. Trump, Mr. Turnbull, uh, Phil Curry from the Financial Review. To, to you, Mr. Trump, just on the region and China and associated issues, the United States Navy has conducted frequently uh, freedom of navigation sail-throughs through the disputed areas. Um, would you like to see the Australian Navy participate directly um, in those operations alongside um, the US allies? And whilst on the region... Can I ask you what your latest thinking is on the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Are you softening your opposition to that or do you remain, remain as opposed as ever? Well, I think the Trans-Pacific Partnership was not a good deal for us. And if they made it a good deal for us, I'd go in. But honestly, it wasn't. I like bilateral deals much more than multilateral. I like to be able to negotiate with one country. And if it doesn't work out, you terminate. And during the termination notice, right after you get sent, they call you and they say, please, let's make a deal, and you fix the deal. When you get into multi, you can't do that. But Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP was a very bad deal for the United States. It would have cost us tremendous amounts of jobs, would have been bad. But there's a possibility we would go in, but they will be offering us a much better deal. I would certainly do that. As far as your lanes are concerned, we'd love to have Australia involved. And I think Australia wants us to stay involved. I have to say we've developed a great relationship with China, other than the fact that they've been killing us on trade for the last long period of time. Killing us, absolutely killing the United States on trade. But we have developed a great relationship with China, probably closer than we've ever had. And my personal relationship, as Malcolm can tell you, with uh, President Xi is, uh, I think, quite extraordinary. He's. Uh, somebody that I like and I think he likes me. With that being said, he likes China and I like the United States. But uh, a lot of things are happening. It's going to be a very interesting period of time. But we do have to straighten out. And as much as I like and respect, really respect President Xi, we have to straighten out the trade imbalance. It's too much. It's no good. OK. Uh, Kieran Gilbert from Sky News. Gilbert Sky News Australia. General Mattis has called China a revisionist power and that there are growing threats from China, yet you're very positive about your relationship with Xi. Um, can you tell us, is it, is it a friend or a foe? And on North Korea, uh, the sanctions, if they don't work, are all options still on the table? Can I get your answer and also the Prime Minister's thoughts? Well, to the second, we'll have to see. Uh, I don't think I'm going to exactly play that card, but we'll have to see. If the sanctions don't work, we'll have to go phase two. And phase two may be a very rough thing, may be very, very unfortunate for the world. But hopefully the sanctions will work. We have tremendous support all around the world for what we're doing. It really is a rogue nation. If we can make a deal, it'll be a great thing. And if we can't, something will have to happen. So we'll see. As far as uh, General Mattis is concerned, I mean, he has that view, and a lot of people have that view. Uh, China's tough. They're getting stronger. They're getting stronger to a large extent with a lot of the money they've made from having poor leadership in the United States, because the United States leadership has allowed them to get away with murder. With that being said, I think we can have a truly great even trading relationship with China, hopefully that's going to work out, and hopefully the relationship I have with President Xi will make that happen. Only time will tell. Thank you. Well, I can confirm that uh, uh, 
President Trump and President Xi uh, see eye to eye in, um, in, uh, in every respect. Uh, and they, they have a, it, it is, it's very clear at the meetings I've been at, uh, which, which we've attended in the region, the East Asia Summit and uh, so forth, a APEC, the respect that they have with each other, and I think it's the most single most important relationship uh, between China and the United States. It's clearly uh, very respectful, very frank, very clear-eyed. Uh, for, for our own part, uh, we see China's rise as being uh, overwhelmingly a positive for the region and for the world. The critical thing, of course, is the rule of law is maintained. You know, that is, you know, the, 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 there are people that want to try to paint uh, the United States and its, and its allies like Australia as being against China in some sort of rerun of the Cold War. Uh, you know, that's, that, that, that is not appropriate, it's not accurate. What we need to ensure is that the rules of the road, the rule of law, the rules-based system where, you know, big countries can't push around little countries, where to quote Lee Kuan Yew all those years ago, where you don't have a world where the big fish eat the little fish and the little fish eat the shrimps, where you have that rule of law that protects everybody, that is what has enabled the great growth in our region. That's what's enabled hundreds of millions of people in our region and including in China to be lifted out of poverty. So maintaining that rules-based order is what we are committed to and we all have a vested interest in doing so. And I just want to say again to the President that, the, that his, his presence, his own personal presence in our region at the end of last year was sent such a powerful message the regular visits by Secretary Tillerson, Secretary Mattis, and of course, the presence of the United States Navy and so many other manifestations of American commitment to the region is so important to maintaining that rules-based order. Believe me, that has been the foundation of the success, the prosperity, and the security these last 40 or more years. I don't think we've ever had a better relationship with China than we do right now. The only thing that can get in its way is trade, because it's so one-sided, it's so lopsided, and the people that stood here for many years in this position, right where I am right now, should never have allowed that to happen. It's very unfair to the United States, and it's very unfair to the workers of the United States. Very, very unfair. And even today, it's extremely hard on companies that want to do business in China because the barriers are incredible, whereas the barriers coming into our country are foolishly not. Foolishly. I believe in reciprocal trade. If they do something to us, we do something to them. Well, that never happened. And it's gotten worse and worse over the years, but we'll correct it. That can be the only thing that can get in the way of a truly long-term great relationship, because we have all the ingredients for friendship. From the Washington Examiner, Gabby. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, your Chief of Staff, General Kelly, has recommended ending the practice of granting interim security clearances to members of the Trump administration. Yeah. If that proceeds, would you be willing to grant a waiver to Jared Kushner, one of your senior advisors? Well, Jared's done an outstanding job. I think he's been treated very unfairly. He's a high-quality person. Uh, he works for nothing, just so, you know, nobody ever reports that, but he gets zero. He doesn't get a salary, nor does Ivanka, who's now in South Korea, long trip, representing her country. And we cannot get a better representative. In fact, the First Lady, Melania, was telling me what a great impression she made this morning when she landed in South Korea. Jared is um, truly outstanding. He's, he's, he was very successful when he was in the private sector. He's working on peace in the Middle East and some other small and very easy deals. They've always said peace in the Middle East, peace between the Palestinians and Israel is the toughest deal of any deal 
There is. Malcolm, I've heard this all my life, that as a former dealmaker, although now you could say maybe I'm more of a dealmaker than ever before, you have no choice as president to do it right. But the hardest deal to make of any kind is between the Israelis and the Palestinians. We're actually making great headway. Jerusalem was the right thing to do. We took that off the table. But Jared Kushner is right in the middle of that. And he's an extraordinary dealmaker. And if he does that, that will be an incredible accomplishment and a very important thing for our country. So General Kelly, who's doing a terrific job, by the way, is uh, right in the middle of that. We inherited a system that's broken. It's a system where many people have just, it's taken months and months and months to get many people that do not have a complex financial, you know, complicated financials. They don't have that, and it's still taken months. It's a broken system, and it shouldn't take this long. You know how, how many people are on that list? People with not a problem in the world. So that'll be up to General Kelly. Uh, General Kelly respects Jared a lot, and General Kelly will make that call. I won't make that call. I will let the general, who's right here, make that call. But Jared's uh, doing some very important things for our country. He gets paid zero. Ivanka, by the way, gets paid zero. She gave up a very good and very strong, solid, big business in order to come to Washington because she wanted to help families and she wanted to help women. She said, Dad, I want to go to Washington. I want to help women. And I said, you know, it's, Washington's a mean place. She said, I don't care. I want to help women. I want to help families. And she was very much involved, as you know, in the child tax credit. And now she's working very much on family leave, things that I don't think would have been in the agreement if it weren't for Ivanka and some of our great senators, etc. But she was very much in the forefront of that. So uh, I will let General Kelly make that decision. And he's going to do what's right for the country. And I have no doubt he'll make the right decision. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Prime Thank Minister, uh, your country conducted a buyback program of semi-automatic weapons back in the mid-90s and hasn't had a mass shooting ever since. Is this something that you've discussed with President Trump, and did you at all re urge him to reconsider his current recommendations to combat mass shootings in the United States? Well, the, our history with uh, gun control and regulation is obviously very different to the United States. And, and you're right, uh, there was a mass shooting in Tasmania in 1996. And my predecessor, John Howard, who's very well known uh, here in the United States, Prime Minister for nearly 12 years, uh, John uh, undertook some very big reforms and basically uh, semi-automatic and let alone automatic weapons are essentially not available. Uh, indeed, uh, there are many classes of the, the range of firearms that are available to uh, uh, people that don't have a specific, you know, professional need, like, you know, people who are involved in pest control and so forth, uh, are very, very limited. But it's, it's a completely different uh, context, historically, legally, and so forth. Uh, we are very satisfied with our laws. We maintain them. Uh, we, they're there. They're well known. You've referred to them. But we certainly don't presume to uh, provide... Uh, you know, a policy or political advice on, on that matter here. This is a, a, you have a, an amendment to your constitution uh, which deals with uh, gun ownership. You have a very, very different history and I uh, will um, focus on our own political arguments and debates and uh, uh, wish you wise deliberation in your own. And I have to add to that, they're very different countries with very different sets of problems. But I think we're well on the way to solving that horrible problem that happens far too often in the United States. Thank you very much, everybody. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much. Thank you.
Thus concludes the press conference that President Trump held with Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull of Australia. They covered a range of issues from their cooperation on trade, also on foreign policy and security, especially in the Asian region. Uh, they even talked about guns towards the end. And there was a question about Syria. And we are definitely going to talk about that more on the other side of this. Please stay tuned to Fox News Channel and this Fox station for continuing coverage of this story. I'm Dana Perino in New York. All right, I'm back with Dan Henninger and Lanhee Chen. Uh, thank you for sticking around with me during this whole thing. I'll ask you, Dan, just for some general thoughts. It was, they, they covered a lot of ground. They sure did cover a lot of ground, Dana. And uh, I think there's a few things, we, dots we can connect here. Uh, one shared value they talked a lot about was something they described as mateship, right? The relationship between Australia and the United States. Yeah. And clearly, Australia regards the United States as very important to it in the Pacific region. Well, there are a lot of other countries that rely on the United States for mateship, too. And I think Mr. Trump talked about a couple of things that were very interesting in that respect. In Syria, in the Middle East, he denounced Russia, Iran, and Syria for what he called a human rights disgrace over there. He then said, our only goal is to get rid of ISIS, and then we're leaving. Now, I'll tell you something. Iran, Syria, and Russia will do, be doing somersaults in the hallways if the United States pulls out after they get rid of ISIS, because obviously Iran and Russia are trying to actually turn Syria into a kind of military base to project power out from that area. Mm -hmm. In the Pacific, he said, our only problem with China is the trade deficit. Well, those countries over there feel their problems with China are larger than that, because China is projecting power into the Pacific, mm -hmm. the artificial reefs that they've militarized, and clearly China has in mind to push the United States out of that area. So I think the president, in terms of mateship, has a lot of work to do. The whole Trans-Pacific Trade uh, Partnership that they were talking about, that those countries have done, is about serving as a ballast against China's uh, economic hegemony. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those issues were raised in that press conference, but I think Malcolm Turnbull probably walked away saying, there's still a lot of work to do with the United States in well, the Pacific. And he really, um, Lan, he, Malcolm Turnbull was encouraging the president through the media, through the press conference, to stay in the region, that the United States being there is so important. One of the things that happened right before the press conference is that the United States um, has issued new sanctions against North Korea. Here's a statement from Nikki Haley saying, today's unprecedented actions make it clear that the United States will not let up on North Korea. We are ramping up the pressure on the North Korean regime, and we're going to use every tool at our disposal, including working with our allies and through the UN, to increase the pressure until North Korea reverses course. The world will not accept a nuclear North Korea, she said. And so you have the entire region, now actually the world, worried about this and the president needing to tighten the screws on North Korea today. This is exactly the right strategy. The maximum pressure strategy on North Korea, these sanctions are really significant. I think that they further that campaign. I think it's no coincidence this is coming on the tail end of the Olympic Games, which have been uh, contested in South Korea. Mm -hmm. I think it is interesting. You know, people don't often realize the value of the U.S.-Australia relationship, right. and it is so critical to the to the security of the entire Indo-Pacific region. It's critical, frankly, how the U.S. deals with China. Mm -hmm. I did think it was interesting mm -hmm. how close of a relationship they emphasized, both the president as well as the prime minister, this close relationship between uh, President Xi Jinping of China and President Trump. That's not, those aren't two leaders, generally speaking, that you might consider to have that close relationship. And, and the one thing President Trump said, which was interesting, was what we really want is we want a good trade deal out of this. Well, that kind of um, minimizes mm -hmm. the importance of traditional issues that we've had with China, like human rights. We, um, we had news that broke during that press conference, Dan. Um, Rick Gates, who was the deputy campaign manager for the Trump campaign, uh, he was due in court at 2 o'clock, and he pled guilty to two counts. I don't have all of the details yet, but Catherine Herridge, a uh, Fox News reporter, was in the courtroom, and I'm sure she'll be coming up on Fox News soon, so you'll want to stay tuned for that. But your thoughts, as now this is the third, I'm sorry, he's the fifth known person to plead guilty guilty to charges in the Mueller probe. There was never any question, Dana, that once they appointed a special prosecutor, in this case Robert Mueller, there would be indictments of some people for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Keep in mind, though, that what Rick Gates and Paul Manafort did or what they were indicted for predated their involvement with the Trump campaign. So there's no obvious connection yet between the Trump campaign and Russian collusion, which is right. Robert Mueller's mandate. Except that, um, Lanny, that um, apparently the activity that they were doing, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with the Trump campaign, but what they're accused of in terms of the conspiracy and probably tax evasions was happening in 2016 and into 2017. So it does bring it forward a little bit. It does. And I think that the question is always about the extent of the activity. It's always about the extent of how far it went. You know, remember, conspiracy is two or more people. So obviously, we know Manafort, we know Gates. The question in the Mueller investigation is who else? And I think mm -hmm. those will be the next shoes to drop as we go forward. Can I do one other topic with you while we wait for Catherine Harris? She's at the courthouse. I just want to ask you, Dan, about the significance of what President Trump had already said we were going to move the United States um, Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, last week, I think just I think it was just last week, Mike Pence, the vice president, said we plan to do that by the end of 2019. The president announcing today that's actually going to move that forward and try to do it.